Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome back to The Dan Nessel Show. I'm your host, Dan Nessel, and today I'm here with Tom Boatman. Tom's the owner of Native Creative, a Tokyo-based creative agency that develops brands and marketing communications in English and Japanese, and he helps clients deliver powerful presentations. But more than all that, I've known Tom for about 20 years, and it's no exaggeration to say that this guy is pretty much directly responsible for my career as a marketer and as a creator because Tom really taught me how to write. And we'll get into that, and we'll also talk about living in Japan, we'll talk about working for Japanese companies, we'll talk about marketing and writing and all that good stuff uh, in our conversation. So without further ado, please welcome Tom Boatman. Dude, it's good to see you. Yeah, great to see you. Welcome to the show, my man. <laughs> you're, with, you're with Tom Boatman, the legend. This is, this is one of the favorite things I have about doing this podcast is reconnecting with people I, you know well reconnecting is a kind of a mis misdirection here because i've always been connected with tom right it's not like we fell out of touch and i'm reconnecting based on this podcast but the fact is that you know tom and i are on opposite ends of the earth right now and having having the podcast is a um, is a great excuse to have a longer deeper conversation without interruptions and like kind of dig in a little bit on, you know, what's going on with Tom and with, and with, you know, with his business and with, with our lives. So, um, I welcome, welcome Tom to the show and, uh, how you doing? Good, good. Thank you, Dan. Great to, <laughs> great to be talking to you again. Yeah. Look today, I think on, on the show, let me give you a little bit of a, of a, of a rundown of, of me and Tom first. Um, I've known Tom for what, 20 Years now, wow, basically. Has it been that long? It might be almost, almost 20 years. We were introduced by Scott Milano, one of my earlier guests, who you might recall from Tang Branding. And, um, you know, the naming, the naming dude, uh, who is a great mutual dear friend of both of ours. Um, and back in the day, when I was starting out my copywriting career, and you know, I've told the story before where I had zero copywriting experience and I just got you know, business cards printed said I was a copywriter. Scott, believe me, uh, <laughs> he gave me his clients. But one, another thing that Scott gave me was his contacts in the uh, advertising industry in Tokyo. Um, and Tom Boatman, who I'm here with today, uh, was the first or second person that I met through Scott. And we have been thick as thieves since then. Um, so yeah, almost 20 years. And um, well, I just want to share a little a little bit of a, of a story to kind of frame up Tom for you. I was about three or four months maybe into my new line of work as a copywriter, you know, back in those days. And Tom, Tom, if you remember, I was working at the, um, well, I had just started in writing um, and I was um, doing the forum for corporate communications in Tokyo, right? And Scott introduced us and Tom happened to be working on, you know, some brochure work for a couple of big Japanese companies, mostly um, I believe it was, I'm not going to say the name of the company, but they were um, like semiconductor technical type stuff. And uh, we were working on this. Tom just said, yeah, sure. I'll give you a shot. And uh, we, you know, we met. Apparently Tom thought that I had some talent and decided to take me on. Um, so I started off working for Tom and, or actually like Tom being my client, if you want to make be technical about it, but I was working for Tom and, um, you know, started, you know, doing some of the writing for some brochures uh, that, that his firm, uh, Native Creative, was hired to do. So in the early days, though, you know, I thought I was, I always thought I was a great writer. But working with Tom for about a week made me realize that I was basically at that time still shit. As a <laughs> I mean, Tom put me in my place in a very nice way. But... Um, you know, I attribute certain moments in my life to professional learnings that have stayed with me and that have, that have had tremendous effect on my career moving forward. And working with Tom was one, of those, was, was one of those experiences, but certainly this particular time, I remember, was formative. 
I had been busting my ass on this assignment, you know, because I said I was a copywriter, but I hadn't really done any serious copy assignments. So I get this thing from Tom and I'm working on this, on this copy and doing, you know, writing benefits of products and, you know, putting together a, a, a narrative or about this particular set of, I believe it was, it was semiconductors. And um, part of the assignment was to do these headlines and subheads. You know, it took me forever. And finally, like I'm pushing the deadline and Tom says, okay, you need to send it to me. So I send out, I send over my manuscript over to Tom and I thought it was good. And then I get a call an hour later. Can we go through this a little bit? So Tom walks me through this, through it. And he says, first of all, who are you writing for? You know, we need to think about Aunt Millie. You need to do the Aunt Millie test. Are you doing the Aunt Millie test? I said, what's the Aunt Millie test? Tom says, well, you have to write as though you're, as though you're writing for your Aunt Millie, who's, you know, you know, 75 years old and doesn't really understand what we're talking about, but you'll be, but she will be able to understand if she reads what you write. And I'm paraphrasing there because that's, that sounds more like me than it does like Tom, but that's basically what he told me to do. And it's like something clicked. Like from that moment, something clicked. I was still not that great at head, at headlines, but Tom walked me through that over the coming days and coming weeks. And, um, you know, over the years that followed, I ended up doing quite a bit of work for Tom. And then when I went out and, uh, left my business and started in as an internal uh, marketing PR manager, you know, the first person I turned to when I needed help uh, putting some work together for some market entry pieces and for some larger corporate pieces, I went to native creative and I went to Tom. That's a very long way of saying when I met Tom, he took me under his wing. He was an important mentor to me, important teacher in my writing career. And then I, most gladly and happily returned the favor when I went in-house, but because of merit and because I knew that Native Creative and Tom were the best writers in Tokyo. So I don't know, man, I just felt like telling that story because I think that that gives the kind of context you need to understand how much I admire you and how much I really am I'm happy to have you on the podcast. So here we are. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Do you remember any of that stuff? I now that you said it, I remember it, but I don't really remember it as specifically as you do. So it's great that, you know, you can make an impression on someone and not even re remember it. And then it's still there. So and that's one of those things where, like, it's a wonderful life. You know, you don't know how many mm -hmm. people you've touched. And uh, I hope I wasn't too hard on you. We're talking now, right? <laughs> <laughs> there are some people that... that <laughs> I've done that too, and they've really freaked out about it because um, maybe I have been too harsh in the past. But yeah, that the thing that that you mentioned the Aunt Millie, I always called it Aunt Minnie, maybe because I had an Aunt Minnie. And then the other, the one thing that you talked about that I, you didn't add was you're sitting across the kitchen counter talking to her. So it set it sets the stage, right? You're having coffee that gets the conversational voice in there. <clears throat> But yeah, I mean, uh, I think I put that at our website because uh, that wasn't my original concept, actually. When, when I was starting out in advertising, somebody taught it to me. And uh, of course, I passed it on. So yeah. Thank you. And then you didn't go to the rest of the story. So or I guess you did touch on it. But after a while, Dan got into a position to give me work and he helped me build my company into something a lot bigger than it was by giving me a regular uh, retainer type work through one of his companies. And man, we were like jamming for a while on that. Totally. Until the, yeah. uh, I guess it was 2008 when the, the global economy had collapsed. But yeah, yeah those were the, uh, the heady days of native creative in terms of uh, uh, at least sales volume. And uh, yeah. And it was my pleasure. You know, we, yeah, we worked together on, projects that were Asia Pacific wide. And in fact, I think some of the work that you did for us, this is back when I was at, uh, at Robert Half, the recruitment firm, and um, some of the project work that you did for us then, actually, we did, we did the old reverse import of that, or we exported it, I suppose, <laughs> to back to the headquarters in California at the time. And, and a lot of your work was then adopted for, um, for global use. So it was a very mutually beneficial arrangement but also the work was fantastic i mean the work was just was so good like you know tom was always good you're always good at finding the voice you know and being conversational for any b2b 
assignment. And in B2B marketing and B2B writing, as you know, as many of my listeners know, that's not the easiest thing in the world, right? You know? So you look, I, we've, we've set this up that, that I'm talking about jumping into writing and B2B, but I, I think we've gotten ahead of ourselves just a little bit here. Um, first, I want, I want to introduce the world or my world here to, uh, to the Tom Boatman that I know and know well. And, you know, Tom, can you just like tell us how, you, how a kid from New Jersey gets to Tokyo and ends up staying there for 25 years? It's, it's almost been 30 now. 30 it now, 30, right? Yeah. In, uh, on July 1st, it was 30, yeah. From Glassboro to Tokyo. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> so how did it happen? Actually, this is a story I've rehearsed so many times, so I'll, I'll try to give you the short version. But I was working in advertising in New Jersey, and I started out at, at the time, one of New Jersey's largest agencies. And I got that job through one of my dad's connections. I, I, they signed me on as an intern. And then I, I stayed there, and then they, I made, I, I guess, I'd, I'm proud to say that I didn't just waste the internship. I made myself... Uh, someone that they wanted to keep on after the internship. And then they hired me as a junior copywriter. And I was doing retail back then. I don't know if a lot of people mm -hmm. are familiar with retail ads, the ads uh, for supermarkets and auto parts retailers that you get in the newspaper. And that was my, f but like two weeks after I graduated from college, I was writing copy that was on the radio. And you've probably, Americans are used to radio where the DJ reads some copy at the end of a spot yeah. or something. And that was what I was writing. And so I, um, and now that's, that's translated straight into podcasts. Right? Really? A yeah. lot of podcasts do that. Yeah. Now, yeah. 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 That's true. That's yeah. true. By the way, I'm not opposed to such things. If anybody's listening, who cares <laughs> to uh, pay me to do so, but anyway, please proceed. Yeah. So maybe we'll get some products in there later, but <laughs> so yeah, I was driving in my car to work. I, I only drove from Cranford to union in New Jersey, which is short. It's like a what, 15, 20, 15 minute drive. Yeah. And I would, the first day, I, it was like three days after I started working, I heard my spot that I wrote, the copy I wrote, being read by a DJ on the radio that I was listening to. And that was like, nice. wow, this was cool. And so I, I always wanted to be in advertising. Well, I, I'd say like halfway through college, I decided. So I, I kind of felt like I'd made it, you know, at that point, even though it was a long way. And I worked there for about three and a half years. And then um, what you did in those days in advertising was three years and, and move if you wanted to get more money, because there was no way you were going to get a decent salary increase unless you changed jobs. That was just the way it was. Maybe it still is. So I moved to a smaller place that was like a package design firm. And there's kind of some interesting intersections there because that place had three guys that had lived in Japan which is, okay. and this is a small package design firm in New Jersey that was doing, um, they had some pretty big clients like Tuscan Dairies and uh, Sportcraft. I don't know if it's still around, but they made those games that you bring to barbecues, like badminton and, sure. and oh, yeah, yeah, quoits. Yeah. I guess today it's cornhole and stuff like that. Though, yeah. And we were, I was just writing the copy for those boxes. So it was like a step down from writing stuff that was actually on the air. But for me... Immediately, they made me, they had no copy department, so they made me copy director, and I was in charge of everything there. But after a while, they went, they went from package design back to retail because they pulled some guys from my old agency down, and one of those was, a, two of those were the guys who had lived in Japan. And um, I realized that things were not going the way I wanted to. I wanted to be going like doing beer commercials, right, which is every copywriter's dream, I guess, in America. At that time, anyway. And so I started thinking I would just go somewhere else. I'm going to go to another market, but not a big market. Because I couldn't, I kept getting interviews in New York and they'd be like, yeah, your book's not good enough. And book meaning portfolio. So I ended up um, sending my resume all over the place. Fort Lauderdale, mm -hmm. um, Sacramento, you know, El Paso. And one of the, and this is when you, when you wanted to get a job back then, you would take, you would look at an ad in Ad Week magazine, you know, paper versions, right? And you would send a letter to apply to it. So I applied to a job, but uh, it just said Tokyo copywriter. I'm like, 
eh, why not? I like Japanese food. I thought I liked Japanese food, right? It was, it was American, uh, you know, hibachi grill stuff. Yeah. And, um, but I could use chopsticks. <laughs> so, <clears throat> excuse me. So then a, a couple weeks later, I get this call like at 10 o'clock at night. And it was the, the copywriter or the copy chief from this Japanese, you know, um, it was more of a PR agency. And uh, I'm like, I was angry, man. 10 o'clock at night on a, on a weekday. I'm like, well, what, are you, what, are, who, what are you calling me for? And he goes, is this Tom Boatman? And the guy who, who hired me had a really kind of laid back kind of, he wasn't, he wasn't actually a good communicator, let's put it that way. But he was a really great guy. He was my first kind of boss here in Japan. And he goes, did you answer an ad? I'm like, what? Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so finally, oh, money. Quiet. I'm like, okay, I was like laying in bed watching HBO or something, you know? And, uh, and then I'm like, oh yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and, and it, the guy was knocked out by my letter because that, that's when you, you actually wrote a letter and put it in an envelope. Yeah. And I, and I said, I would I thought I was late or maybe I was making a joke about not being quick enough to uh, reply. And I said, I would have sent this earlier, but my dog ate, the original copy or something, you know, the old, my dog ate it. Yeah. And I made a few more jokes and he liked that. And that's what got me in the door. And, uh, and then, but that guy was so like loopy. And uh, I was just like, do I really want to work here? And then he put on his, um, the creative director, who was this um, uh, Filipino American guy from Minnesota who had worked in big agencies. And he was just like, mm. uh, I guess we shouldn't say names here. I'm not going to say names. He was just like so cool. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, there's someone there who knows the, you know, who's been in advertising. And uh, I still wasn't sure, but I was pretty sure if I could get this job, I was going to take it. And uh, they had an interview. The interview was set up in Manhattan by a former employee. So they, they weren't going to fly anyone out or anything like that. It wasn't that bad. Right. And so the day I went to interview for that, um, she she lived like in, it's probably, the area has probably changed. That was down near Battery Park or something. Yeah. And, you know, this is before all that stuff, 9-11, blah, blah, blah. And she um, invited me to her house like on a Sunday. And I was like, I think I went out the night before. I was running late. I'm driving my car to Manhattan trying to find a place to park. And it's one of these places where like there's nine buildings and they all look alike, you know? And I was like, I was thinking it was like 40 minutes late. And I opened the door and I'm like, Oh, I'm, I'm sweating. You know, I had a suit on. And she goes, the first thing she said, she goes, Oh, I didn't expect you to be on time. And I was like, wow, wow. this lady is cool. <laughs> it just totally disarmed the situation, made it relaxed. I mean, it was like coffee at her house, but you know, you still, you, you want to be on time, right? It's a big chance. And then yeah. she recommended to them to hire me. And all of a sudden I'm like, I think I'm going to Japan. And then it was only the salary plus, you know, I'm going to Japan. And, and what she told me was I was, I had concerns that the place was not, how, how should you say? It was not like on that track, that, that track to go to a big agency like and do yeah. the beer commercials or the car commercials. It was a PR production firm. And she told me this. she goes, don't think of it as a career move. Think of it as a life move. Hmm. And I was like, yeah, she goes, you'll get a great life experience. You'll go out there. And if you don't like it, you can always come back after two years. It's two year contract. And I get to Japan and I just loved it. You know, I, I, yeah. a couple of first days I got lost in Tokyo. I was like, what the heck? I, do you remember that feeling of how hard it is to get well, around Tokyo your first time? Well, it might have been a little different for you because, I mean, you, you didn't speak any Japanese, did you? Didn't speak one word. I mean, I asked them, yeah. I go, should I start studying? They go, ah, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't read it. Not only can't you speak it, you can't read anything. I mean, it's like you go to Spain, at least I can read the signs, right? I couldn't read yeah. anything. So, Yeah, and, and you know, when the – when I first went to Tokyo and when I went to, went to Japan, my very first, I first landed in Tokyo. <clears throat> it wasn't too long after that, Tom. I mean, it was just a few years after you landed there. But um, 
I had a base in Japanese, right? So I, at least like I could read the signs, you know, and I, I could tell a cab where I wanted to go. And like, I could do some basics and I had, you know, I, I had college Japanese, not actual life Japanese at the time, but um, yeah, very different. I think it's a very different experience because it would be, because like when I landed in Japan and I started hanging around with some other non-Japanese people, it was the Tom Boatmans of the world who would hang out with me as their sort of unofficial translator when we go to the izakaya to the to the drinking establishment, right? Yeah. Which was very common, by the way. There was always that guy. Sometimes I was that guy uh, who kind of spoke a little Japanese. But you know, obviously over time I got a lot better at it. But uh, and so did you. Yeah. You know, so for me, being there for that long, you, that guy yeah. became my wife because my wife <laughs> was right. like the fr- one of the first people I met when I when I got off the plane and uh, and she was she was quite unique, I thought. And uh, we ended up going to a movie together because I didn't know. I was a little nervous about how do I find out about the movies here and stuff. And and she she's a movie maniac. And uh, yeah, so I started. I think I started dating her like after only about three months. And then uh, I think that that's probably what seals the deal, right? When you get married to a Japanese woman, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. So then, not always. But yeah, pretty much, yeah, yeah, yeah. In your case, when you did the reverse, right? Yeah. Uh, so, well, well get, getting married certainly helped me to stay there longer. Yeah. Um, it was an incentive for me to stick around, but I, I probably would have stayed longer anyway. I, I mean, you know, which makes me feel a lot better about my wife, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Like, like I didn't stay because of her, yeah. you know, and I didn't get married because I wanted to stay. Like neither those two things have, are different. They don't have one. They don't have anything to do with one another. So like, exactly. You know, yeah. Yeah. Oh, definitely me. I, I think it's like, uh, we were in the same office and uh, one day she, she got hit by a motorcycle, like, and uh, she had an accident and I was sitting into, in the, we had a morning meeting every morning. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if you had that yeah. Robert half or typical, and it, typical Japanese. Just, and you had to be yeah. there. I was, I was often late. And uh, back in those days I had that issue and uh, she wasn't there. And so we're all sitting there and um, they said, Oh, Sakagami-san had an accident, and I was just like, our our relationship was under wraps at that time because it was probably frowned mm-hmm. upon. And I was just like, I was, I, I couldn't. My emotions were like locked because I, I was like, you know, what, you want to say, oh my god, what happened? And that's when I decided to marry her because I, I didn't want to say goodbye to her at night, not knowing if I'd ever see her again. I did not know that story. I've known you this long. Yeah, I, didn't know that I was story. seeing at the conference room, and I couldn't <laughs> pretend like. Hey, what, what, what happened? You know, I just had to like sit there and like, oh my God. And then I called her like right after, you know, I don't even think we had cell phones back then. So I was like, mm. yeah, a lot of things happened in the, uh, all that stuff happened in the nineties and two thousands, you know, the, it, the later nineties. Yeah. I, I remember so the on. first, yeah. like with the first time I heard of email, I'm like, somebody kept saying, this is the future email. I'm like, what, what is that? E- what does that mean? Electric? What is that? I, I don't get it. <laughs> Hell, I remember just before moving to Tokyo. So just a couple of years before I met you, wrapping up as a as a as an as an English instructor because I was a teacher in rural Japan for a while for three years, and my last year in rural Japan was amazing. But you know, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what my next step is. So I got you know hundreds of resumes printed up, and I told this story on another episode, so I'm not going to go into it too much. But I had to sit there and just mail out resumes, right? Because this was pre email, yeah. you know. And um, to the same effect, I didn't get any answers at all. So it didn't matter <laughs> whether I was doing by hand or by email. It's, it's, you know, never worked. The only thing that's ever really, really worked for is, uh, is for me anyway, is to uh, to meet people, know people. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I, and uh, get the human connection. I think that I, I read a statistic way back when where any time any time a job is you see it like advertised, it's almost already filled or something like that. I mean, or X number of people have already applied to it by the time you've seen the job. And there's, there's like someone in the yeah. queue. I don't know if that's still true today with the, well, I mean, it doesn't mean don't try yeah. um, to, today, of course, now it's all, you know, if you apply online to, to a role, your resume is going to be parsed by an artificial intelligence based applicant tracking system that is going to, you know, decide whether or not it's ever going to see the light of day in the first place. And then it's got to make it to the to the recruiter or, or to the hiring manager 
who's going to in about seven seconds decide whether or not they're going to see you based on the, you know, the keywords that they see or whatever. So it's a numbers game and it's a, it's a hard game to play. Um, if you are out there looking for a, uh, just being an applicant. Out there so the, for, the art of the role. cover letter, which got me to Japan is, is dead, huh? I don't, you know, I, I, I think that that completely varies hiring manager to hiring manager, but I, you look, if you can find the right person to send the, the cover letter to, you're probably, it's probably a huge advantage, you know, using things like LinkedIn and, and the, you know, social media that's available to you to track down people. And I'm not going to say stalk, but at least, you know, do some research, find out who you're supposed to talk to. And if you can get in front of that person, then, you know, you might, you might have a better chance of skipping over the applicant tracking systems. but Hey, we digress a little bit. Um, you made it through and you, uh, you know, you're, you're in Japan and got married. Oh, yeah. So, you know? so the, the next big part of that story was I was at that place for well, like three years and it really started to get bad. Like it was just a bad environment. The, the, mm-hmm. the boss, she was like really, like really tough. Like one, one morning, one morning at the morning meeting, I announced that I was going to start studying Japanese. So I would need to leave like early on one, two nights a week or something. And she goes, I haven't approved that. You can't, you can't do that. Like in front of everyone. And I guess like, then I realized, oh, I trumped her authority by that. I I didn't know about that stuff back then. But uh, yeah, they weren't really eager for me to learn Japanese either. So I had to do that all on my own. But uh, at one point I just decided I was gonna leave. So I started, you know, going through that process. But at that time, I did the uh, networking book with Paul Ferguson, Mm -hmm. Networking in Japan, which was his idea. And it was, so I I left the company. And um, when I told them I was going to leave, she goes, oh, we didn't think we were going to rehire you anyway. It was was funny. Oh, nice. But it was a really oppressive environment in that time. And, uh, you know, we weren't doing the, the kind of the big agency stuff I wanted to do. And so I went freelance. And because I had been networking, in Tokyo back then, I think you remember this is like you said, the forum for corporate communications mm-hmm. and you could just go out and you would, and back then it was a little easier because the people who went to those events were not financial advisors. And, uh, what's the other one? Fin- recruiters. recruiters and financial advisors. There was, there was a lot of different people and you could, Oh, I have a, I have a marketing company. I have a design firm. It was a lot easier to get contacts that were more, worthwhile, nothing against recruiters yeah. and financial advisors, but you only really need one of each of those, you know? So yeah. <laughs> I went freelance and I had tons of work, but it was, it made it easy because at that time I was married and my wife had a you know pretty solid job. So we could, we didn't have to worry about it. But on the other hand, it just worked great. I remember s- sitting in front of my little tiny, one of those original Macs, you know? And, yeah. And, uh, and then at that time, one of the guys I met through the Forum for Corporate Communications, the FCC, was a guy who worked for Hakuhodo. And, yep. and we clicked on some, for some reason, and he hired me to do some freelance. And at the time, I had a, I had a, a small-time gig at Yamaichi Shoken, which is a, it's dead now. It's a financial, you know, financial yeah. company. It was a victim of, of one of the many. Yeah. Multiple, multiple mini collapses. The purges. It mergers was purged. and so on. Purges, yeah. <laughs> And uh, I was just doing financial rewriting. It was horrible work, but it, you know, they gave me a, a slot. And, and this guy gave me some freelance. And it was weird. I was doing freelance at that job. That's how boring it was. And he, he liked my stuff. And so, so all of a sudden, I'm doing Honda ads. You know, And I'm like, wow, this is what I always wanted to do. And after a while, he said, we're thinking about taking you on here. And that company was Hakuhodo, which... Your, your listeners probably don't know it's it's around the it's in the top 10 agencies in the world it's number two in Japan everyone knows Densu yeah. Hakuhodo is their kind of rival I guess and I was like I I was like wow this is what I want you know because they had they had Honda they had Toyota they had you know whatever but anyway that's how I got the job at Hakuhodo which is the job I wanted way back in Jersey and that pretty much locked me into the career that I want to have here doing ads yeah. for big car companies and beer companies and whatnot. And then, and then how much, how long were you doing that before you founded your own company before you went out on your own and just went full on entrepreneur? So I stayed at Hakuhodo five years and, 
they made my title creative director at some point. And I, I realized I wanted to learn more things that I think you maybe you've worked at a Japanese company where mm-hmm. you're just like slotted when you work at a Japanese company back in those days anyway, and you're a foreigner, even if you have really good Japanese, they slot you as like, you're the copywriter. And they would allow me to hire people, but they wouldn't allow me to, um, I mean, to hire vendors, but they wouldn't allow me to manage budgets. They wouldn't allow me total control of a project. There was always like a Japanese uh, creative director, someone who was kind of really pulling the strings. So I decided I wanted more responsibility. I wanted to leave. And uh, I asked them for a big raise and they're like, no, I asked them for a promotion to a certain thing. And they were like, yeah, but you're a foreigner. (laughs) <laughs> that was the response. Oh my goodness. It was like the these go to eleven moment for me, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, there's there, there's a, there's another expression that always pops up around those conversations. People ask me about that, and you know, I love talking to Japan people because they get you guys get it immediately. But it's just like computer says no. <laughs> I mean, yeah. There's, yeah. and I'm I'm not trying to to slight any of my Japanese friends or the Japanese culture in any way, shape, or form. But you're talking about a organizational culture that is extremely process driven and has multiple layers of hierarchy and consensus. So it's virtually impossible to just get a decision immediately that's off the menu. You know, it yeah. takes a lot of work to even get one change. Sometimes that's a really good thing. Sometimes it's not a good thing at all. And you know, where that clash is, is often where you find people like us, right? Who are pushing for things to happen faster, willing to take slower, take it slower, but not necessarily as slow as it needs to go. And certainly faster than anybody wants it to go. So it's a, it's a very tough spot to be in sometimes for, for those of us in Japanese companies, you know? Oh yeah. And and the other thing is that you, I I was talking to a friend the other day, uh, you know, I'm Ed Thompson. And he said, he goes, I stopped trying to be Japanese about 20 years ago. He, he realized that no matter what you did, you were always that guy, you were that you know, foreigner, that guy gene. And, uh, and I, I re- related a story to him. I talked about someone that we knew, both knew from Mori and Company, the, the huge uh, construction building company. Mm-hmm. And I remember going, being in a room, and this guy was like super fluent Japanese, throwing his... And I was looking at him, and I was there with Hakahoto, and they they bring me along to show that they have a foreign co- copy chief, and sitting there, but they never asked me to participate. I was just there, and I yeah. realized that role, and I was happy with it. And every now and then they'd say, "What do you think about that, Tom?" But sometimes I wouldn't have to say anything. My whole role was just to be there. Yeah. And I look at this guy speaking, and he was spitting out all these stuff, and I realized he had no more respect than I did from his colleagues. He was in the same role, but he didn't know it. Yeah. <laughs> and yep. and that's that's what you have to realize here. After you've been here for a while, you, you're always going to be a foreigner, no matter how good your Japanese becomes, no matter how native you go. But if you can embrace that role and and learn how to work within that, then I think you'll you'll feel much better about what you're doing. You'll be comfortable. I've always felt comfortable here. Yeah. As long as I realize, like, okay, that's who I am. Yep. Don't hide your foreignness, but you know, don't make honest, don't don't make waves for no reason. You know, that's the other thing, right? Yeah, I've gone through through highs and lows with my relationship with my, you know, Japanese employers or Japanese customers or, or you know, um, even Japanese relatives for that matter. Uh, <laughs> you know, where where it's just sometimes you you under you have to understand that you're coming from a very very different place and a different thinking process. And it's not that you want different things in as much as it takes a lot different ways to get there. And sometimes you don't want the same things, you know, when there's a values problem, there's a values problem and you just have to dig in and figure out what that is. But generally speaking for work, you know, you, you run into things as a guest worker or as a person who is out of their culture, out of their element. And you try to assimilate sometimes, sometimes you try to, uh, you know, affect change. And your role has to sometimes varies day to day. You don't always know what hat you're going to be wearing on a particular, at a particular time. Um, but the longer you're there, like the longer I was in Japan, the more I kind of started to understand today is the day that I should be a change agent. 
today, or this is the group of people where it's, where it's much more comfortable for me to push a little bit. But generally speaking, if it's before 5 p.m. and you're at the office, you're doing, you are playing the consensus game. And then after 5 p.m., when you're not in the office, that's when you can be a change agent is kind of the fundamental rule of thumb that, that, I, that I came across. Um, that's interesting. You know. that what's most interesting to me about that statement is that you actually left at 5 p.m. Well, you know what I mean. <laughs> the metaphorical 5 p.m. I know. I know you mean. <laughs> if, if, if it's after 10 p.m., <laughs> once you leave the office. <laughs> well, as long as it's physically outside the office and yes. in a, an establishment that has copious amounts of alcohol, especially, you are, uh, you know, then, then change agency can, can really be effective. Um, well, that, that's the other thing too. In Japan, you, if you miss those those nomikais, which is like a drinking party after work, you you miss out on a lot of stuff. Even yeah. if it just it seems like small talk, but that's when a lot of the decisions and the kind of well, my, my last podcast um, that I just recorded the other day was with uh, Raymond McConnell, um, who is a global trainer and a real expert in intercultural and cross cultural communications. And that's one of the things he brought up was the whole after he, he called it the after five, I think culture, but um, it doesn't have to be five o'clock, but you know, in some places you go out some places, you just do it. You have to do it. If you want to get on, um, you don't have to necessarily drink anymore. You know, you can, there's ways around that, but you need to be present. Um, and some places you just don't, you know, but Japan is one of those places that you, you kind of do. Yeah. And it, there's another thing that happens here is like, when a decision is made, everybody knows what it is before it's actually announced. And I don't know right. if that's true in America, but never. <laughs> Not that and, I know of. Yeah. You know, I, I've been, I, I come, I'm in a, I'm in a very strange kind of headspace, I suppose. Um, as many of us returnees are like, I heard the term repats for the first time recently. So not an expat, but a repat, a repatriate. A repat. Person. I never yeah. heard that. Right. It's a great term. I think I thank Raymond McConnell for that as well, but um, it repats up a lot of trouble when they go back. And we talked, we've heard about reverse culture shock, right? But repats, um, it goes beyond that. There's there's certain adjustment issues that people face. There's you know the fact that you just miss the place that you were, but also you know you get encultured. So I was in Japan long enough, certainly straight out of college for you know for fifteen sixteen years. So my way of doing business and my way of respecting authority, my way of communicating internally was very much towards the Japanese side. It wasn't, you know, I still had mo- whatever makes me, me was still part of that, but um, that deference, the deference for, for authority, especially um, and the willingness to sort of sit back and be quiet, and wait for the things to happen. Didn't always go over well here in the States. Still doesn't, you know, and I still find myself being a little more deferential than most. And um, it's not always a good quality. You know, sometimes it breeds mistrust if you're too quiet, if you don't make your opinion known. Um, And um, it's I have to I have to basically tread the line between that being that way or sitting with my Japanese bosses and my Japanese colleagues and being the Japanese way. So always back and forth. And always trying to figure it out, and it's it's been a uh, it's been a real experience. And you know, it's only really recently, I think, in the last few years that I've really figured out that like why I was stuck here and there, and why I had some kind of like I had a couple aha moments. Oh, yeah, that's what that means, you know. But um, all that said, I do miss Japan terribly, and I'm, you know, and of course, hanging out with you a lot. But um, you've been there now thirty years, and um, still doing advertising related yeah, so stuff and uh, native creative so. at native creative go native.jp by the way if anybody wants to know more about tom and his work go native.jp but you're one of the people who taught me how to write right so there's there's a few things writing as communication you know um and writing as the fundamental like the cornerstone of all advertising all marketing all communication you know, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that that is basically the key element to anything. I just wanted to ask you, like, what makes for good writing? Tough question, I know, for a writer. But. Well, I think that for me, the first thing I would say is simplicity. 
clarity, simplicity, and a strong voice that sounds unique or natural. So that goes back to that conversational. Even in, and I've, I've been, I had a recent gig of editing academic reports, and these things are so horribly written. And we're doing translations of the Japanese, but you, it doesn't matter because the translator always tells me, this Japanese is so uh, fuzzy. Yeah. There's a Japanese word for it, ai mai. Yeah. It means vague and winding. And you don't have to write that way. It doesn't matter. I, I think probably lawyers have a certain way they have to write things, probably to confuse everyone, but I shouldn't say that. But you, you know what I mean. There are certain... You know, there's academic things, but even in an academic paper, you know, aside from the footnotes, that you can make it very interesting and very conversational. And I think so for writing that simplicity and that tone, that like you're speaking is probably the the thing to me which, which makes good writing. And I mean, you like to read, right? I, we love yeah. to read, read tons of books. And one of the things, if I'm just, I like to go to bookstores and I pick up a book and I look at the dialogue. Right, because that's the that's the that's the juice of a book, right? Don't you think? The hundred percent, the, the expository stuff. And I'm like, okay, how yeah. do they do this dialogue? And I, you can read like three lines, and you can tell like, okay, they're they're not saying they're not using adverbs, you know, and they're. I kind of I kind of get a feeling where this is going. <laughs> are we gonna, are we getting into Elmore Leonard today? <laughs> <laughs> who yeah, who, who mean, Tom, Tom and I have just had had many discussions about how Elmore Leonard is the best writer, or may he rest in peace, was, was, was yes. the best writer of dialogue in the English language, probably since George Bernard Shaw, um, maybe ever. I don't know. But uh, that's, a, that's, a not, that's a bold claim, and I will stand by it. And, and you know, right, you're reading a book, and he, you'll see something weird. I'm, I'm going to have a bad example, but she said uh, obliquely or something. Oh, and all right. of a sudden you're like, wait, wait a minute, what does obliquely mean to me? And what does it mean to her? And how can you say something obliquely? And it just stops you, right? Yeah. And the same thing can be said about business writing. You know, all those those catchphrases, those those words of the day, like whatever. In Japan, we used to have epic making. Now everything is smile in Japan right now. And I have to follow these trends when I'm doing work here because you'll see a word pop up. And it it's not even like, I don't keep... Uh, a logarithms or statistics, but I just know this word is trending now in Japan. Mm -hmm. And the, the latest one is smile to, a f to describe a feeling rather than right. what it actually is. And you see it all and I'll spot it. It's coming. And I know one of my clients is going to say, can you put smile in this? I'm like, well, <laughs> you mean happiness <laughs> is, which is what they mean. Right. So yeah, the writing clarity and, and also I think that a writer, it, it, this doesn't always apply to, well, I guess you could apply it to marketing and advertising. You have to have a voice or you have to find the voice. Mm -hmm. So each client has a voice. And so if you're working for that client, you need to know what that is and establish it. And what what is a voice? It's the difference between the way I talk and you talk, which is not that different, but we each have our own voices and I recognize yours. And often we people do mirroring, right? So when mm -hmm. you're talking to someone – like if I'm talking to someone from Jersey and we we're in Jersey, Jersey going. yeah, we're going to do a little bit differently than when. Forget about it. Yeah. Right. But even, <laughs> you know, that's kind of exaggeration, right? Because yeah. when, whenever somebody says, oh, I'm like, yeah, I, could, I don't want to swear. Are we allowed to swear on this? It's marked explicit. So feel free. Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. You know, that's what everyone thinks. But it's also like it's a cadence. Mm -hmm. It's a pattern. And you can. People think that's only in the spoken word, but that's also in the written word. How short are your sentences? Mm -hmm. You know, can you can you start a sentence with "and"? You know, you have to throw all the rules out the book. And does this client is this okay for this client? You know, yeah. And so I think with writing, you you find that voice for your client and you establish it. And some clients have a somber voice. It usually depends on the product that's being marketed. Of course. And and I think that. That's the key to writing. But within that, to me, the most important thing is simplicity and keep it clear and simple. Try to eliminate long sentences, you know. And a lot of people might think that, oh, that's not, you know, that's not erudite writing, but I disagree. It's the opposite. It's, I mean, no, it is erudite writing. 
I mean, if, if you can get across a concept in, in a simple sentence rather than a complex one, um, then you're a better communicator. Exactly. You've done your job better. I mean, uh, sadly, a lot of a lot of clients don't always see it that way. When they see it, they're like, where are the, where are the rest of the words? You know? <laughs> you, usually I'm asked to cut, but yeah, you're right, though. <laughs> right? Well, I mean, you know, and, and then now, of course, um, having been in the you know, B2B marketing and certainly the content marketing space for so long, I'm keenly interested in the way that storytelling has caught up with marketing in some ways. I mean, when we were starting, when I was starting, and when you were you were already ascendant, but I, I, I was starting out, you're giving me a shot. That's one thing I didn't grasp was that it's about telling a story. And that's where Aunt Minnie came in, right? Yeah. You know, you're talking about storytelling at a time before storytelling became de rigueur, like before you started getting people talking about how you need to be a, a brand storyteller. But what do you think a good cop, good writer is? A brand storyteller, seriously. Exactly. Right? I think that... Yeah. Probably that got embedded in me, even though I didn't know it, was back when I first started out in advertising in New Jersey, I was doing radio spots. And in the beginning, I was just doing those tags, as I mentioned. But as I progressed, I was allowed to actually do a spot. And a radio spot is a mini play in 30 seconds, right? And that's a story, right? In 30 seconds, or sometimes 60, but usually 30 seconds, you have to have a beginning, middle, and end. You have to establish a character. You have to have dialogue, and then it has to have the product mentioned at least three times. You know, yeah, those rules. And yeah, yeah th- those. And but that's a story, right? And I love mm-hmm. the, I really love radio. I wanted to do radio like even more than TV for a while, just because it was more accessible for for young copywriters. But also, it was just fun because, like, you know, this is a podcast, right? People are just going to hear yeah. this when you hear something like, do you ever remember the uh, radio plays they used to do on WOR in New York? It was mystery theater. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it was like a, and it was all just, you just listen. I used to listen to those with my parents in the car. It's like, wow, that's cool. So that's, that's where the storytelling probably, let's say embryo started in me. And I, but I didn't realize it. And then I was telling you, you know, about Aunt Minnie and stuff like that. So that was like, yeah, you're, you're chatting, you're telling stories. Then all of a sudden yeah. people are coming out, stories are big, stories are big. And, and I, I didn't really think anything of it. I just, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. You know, what, what I loved about Aunt Minnie, and, and certainly the way that you kind of helped me to understand this, is later, much later in my career, when I'm hearing so many consultants and brand people and, you know, other communicators just talk about really what we need to be doing is more storytelling, more storytelling, more storytelling. And I just, I was like, well, I thought that's what we do. <laughs> right? I mean, I thought, <laughs> that's what we're supposed to do anyway. Um, don't you know Aunt Minnie? Right. So like this, that should be a guiding principle for anybody who's trying to especially create a brand, a personality for a brand, create a voice for a brand, create a, build something that is going to establish a relationship. So if you want to have a brand that's going to succeed, it has to have relationships with its audiences and with its consumers, you know? I mean, and even more so now, especially because the brand is such an interactive part of people's lives. But how, how do you have something that has a relationship and interacts without it telling stories? Stories are the fundamental way we relate to one another, right? Exactly. I and mean, just humans. I mean, everything we do when we sit down and, and have a meal together or drink, you, you're going to tell a story. Oh, let me tell you this story that happened. And everybody's like rap right there when you say, it. that reminds me of the time I got my, you know, my pants got in a lawnmower or something like that. Right. And boom. But I think that when people started getting into speaking more or using speaking and, and the whole TED Talks thing, that's when it really like took off in, in my mind in terms of like global recognition and understanding. But like you said, they kind of kept that separate from what you're talking about writing, but it, it was always yeah. part of the whole package, right? Of communication. It should well, have so you, Yeah. And, and then you started to hear things like what we really need to do is have your executive be a thought leader. And, you know, have you ever seen a TED talk? Your executive <laughs> really should be out there talking to his audience as though it's a TED talk. Right? <laughs> uh, you know, and, 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 you know, hey, rightly so. You want to have a concept that you can get across in an entertaining and simple way, not always entertaining, but certainly an informative way, a, a compelling way. 
I think. Um, TED Talks have always good at that, but you know, you're talking about really stretching some serious capabilities there to have to just think that any executive can suddenly do a TED Talk, you know. But um, but no, the concept is, is solid, right? You're telling a story, you're, you're you're telling a tale where you get people with a be- with a beginning, a middle, and end, and, uh, or a journey that starts somewhere and ends somewhere, you know, where where people can leave and feel seated, satisfied that that you know they've they've seen something to completion. And this that's that's great. I think that's great advice for any part of marketing that you're doing, any communications, any real performance media, anything, you know. And I know that one thing I really wanted to talk to you about um, was is how that translates into presentations, into speaking, public speaking, because one thing that my listeners, our listeners here should know is that uh, Tom is Toastmaster Supremo and uh, he's been a long time Toastmaster and now spends, um, you know, is developing a, a, a strong business in coaching executives, professionals, people in delivering better presentations, public speaking, and so on, and have a foundation in writing. Being a copywriter, I think, really, I think gives you an edge when you're designing a presentation or when you're doing these kind of public speaking things. Um, However, I'm going to say, we're clearly going to have a part two here, Tom. I mean, I want to dig into the whole art of presentations, the art of public speaking, uh, but for what we've covered today with talking about your journey in Japan, talking about the difference between Japanese companies and, or Japanese culture and, and, and Western culture and, you know, being a global worker in some ways and, um, you know, getting it started to get really into storytelling and copywriting and marketing, you know, considering all that, do you have any, like any last words, takeaways that you want to um, offer the listeners to kind of close this down? I think the the one thing that, the one thing I always have to keep learning is that you you start off with doing something, whether it's marketing, advertising, public speaking, or just uh, working at a you know widget company. And in the beginning, it's hard and it's challenging, and then you you reach a comfort zone. And if you're getting a good salary, or you know. A, I'm I'm working project to project now, so that doesn't apply to me. But if you're getting a good salary, like I was when I was at Hakuhodo, you can just slide and you can just skate. And I sh- I could have stayed there, and I would have had a lot more money <laughs> right now, for sure. But I always wanted to challenge myself, and I think this is something that it sounds obvious. It sounds obvious, but if you, if you continue to challenge yourself and say like, you know what, this is really great, but I want to learn this. And I think, you know, people, everyone says this. it's all about learning, lifetime learning. And actually you inspired me to get into, like, to try to do something with a podcast or, nice. you know, or I, I just produced a video. I didn't produce it. I shot it last week after another guy challenged me to do it. And um, I might send that to you for your, for your advice later on. But Happy to look at it. Yeah. I, I was like, Ugh. and I, I finally just did it because some guy said, do it in a week. And if he hadn't said that, I probably never would have done it. I've been putting it mm-hmm. off for two years, like you said. You've been putting off the podcast. But I think as long as you keep challenging yourself and saying, okay, I've got to this level, where can I go next? You know, especially during this COVID thing, when people were sitting around, I wasn't doing a lot when I was sitting around. I could have done more, but yeah, I got I finally got off my butt and actually, you know, I'm starting to do a little bit more for my uh, my presentation training. And I think if you have that in your head, just go out and do it. Keep challenging yourself. Keep trying to do something new, something different even. You know, that, that would be my advice, I guess. Is that advice? That's terrific. And I think it's advice. It sounds like advice to me, but it sounds like wisdom, laying down some wisdom. Um, and, you know, if anybody has, has listened to my show from the beginning, you'll know that that's a theme that pops up every now and then. It's just you know, to don't be afraid and get out there and just kind of do something um, to shitterate if you need to. You know? uh, I'm getting embarrassed to say that word, by the way. It was not, it was, it was more, I thought it would be more embarrassing the first time, but I think it's more embarrassing like the 10th time I'm saying it now. It's one of those words. 
Do you know that there's some words that you don't like? Like, shitterade sounds like messy. Or, I don't know. It does I, sound I don't like messy. the word fart. I never say fart either. I don't know. Well, well <laughs> yes. I, I believe that, uh, that, that no discussion would be complete without some poo-poo humor. And there it was. Thank you, man. Um, awesome. Well, Tom Bowman, we, we'll, we will eagerly wait number part two where we talk about, where we will talk about um, the art of presentation and public speaking and Toastmasters and all that good stuff. Because frankly, the world needs to know what's in your head about that kind of stuff. So, and I would love to have help deliver that message. Anyway, man, thank you so much. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode of the Dan Nessel show, please head on over to iTunes, Spotify, Google podcasts, or the podcast player of your choice to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. And please don't forget to spread the word. Thanks for listening.